Well, here I am on the eastern shore of Hobart over the river is the main central business district of uh, the city of Hobart in, in Tasmania. And uh, today we're going to continue our journey in the Living with God stream. Last week, uh, David took us for the unit, the incommunicable attributes of God. And we saw just how big God is, but also that he reaches for relationship with us. As we seek to reach for a relationship with God, we need to understand who God is. And to understand who someone is, we need to understand their character, what matters to them. And to understand who God is and to understand God's character, the Bible makes it clear we need to look to Jesus. In fact, uh, we have in the, the book of Hebrews 1, 3, the, the very clear picture that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That Jesus is our representation of God. And so to look to Jesus, we start to understand God. And we get this picture that, God, that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Glory is an interesting word. It's a, it's a word that's used a lot in the Bible. And it's a word that is often misunderstood. Jesus cared a lot about God's glory. He mentions it in the book of Mark two times, uh, in the book of Matthew four times, in the book of Luke 22 times glory is mentioned, but none of those compare to the book of John, which was the last gospel written. And we think probably John had access to the other gospels, but it was like he was saying, there are some things missing that I want to make sure don't go missing. And he records Jesus talking about glory 42 times. 24 times of those are simply between chapters 12 and 17. So much so that some people call the second part of the Gospel of John the glory book, because it's almost like Jesus is preoccupied with glory. The New Testament church, too, really cared about the glory of God. In the uh, New Testament, after the Gospels, we see glory referenced 117 times. So it was a very core concept, a very core way of thinking for the New Testament church. I fear, however, that for many of us, we actually don't know what Jesus was talking about when he used the word glory, and we don't know or understand why it was so important for the New Testament church. I'm not alone in thinking that. The Bible scholar Eugene Peterson, who wrote an English version or translation of the Bible called The Message, he said this, one of the severe handicaps under which the church operates is the cover-up of the glory with respectable substitutes, such as acceptance and honour, success and relevance. Over and over again we miss it. For Eugene Peterson, and for me, as I look around, there is a sense that we use the word glory a lot, but we don't really understand what it means. This is important. The Westminster Shorter Catechism tells us that the chief goal of people, man's chief end, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That glorifying God is the main thing we're meant to do. If that's true, and we don't really know what glory is, then that's a problem, wouldn't you agree? Let's see. I, I might be wrong. Let let's see. Right now, what I'd ask you to do is on Zoom, 
write down in the chat, in the chat bit on Zoom, wherever you are, uh, write down what pictures come to mind for you when you hear the word glory. We're going to take a break the video here uh, and, uh, and see what our responses are to this question of what is God's glory or what pictures come to mind for you when you think about the glory of God. What images come to mind for you when you think about the glory of God? Now I want to take a look at a moment in Jesus' life where he said, now is the Son of Man glorified. If the kinds of answers we've written in the chat were generally true, then the time Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified, will be a little bit confusing. Because for most of us, the word glory means things like honour or applause or maybe a shining light. I'll be interested to see what responses we've had in the chat, but it means things like that. If you've got your Bibles, you might want to, uh, you, you, you'll find many of these Bible references uh, in, in, your, in your notes, but you might want to just follow along if you can. Jesus' story takes a, a very important turn and we see it recorded in Mark 8, Matthew 16 and Luke 9 where he says to the disciples, who do people say I am? And Peter says, uh, well, some say this and some say that. And then Jesus looks him in the eye and says, yeah, but who do you say I am? And, uh, and Peter says, you're the Messiah. And you can almost see the look of relief crossing Jesus' face. And he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because it's God that showed you this. Uh, and on this rock, I'll build my church. And we're going to talk more about this transaction later uh, in the course, as we talk about what does it mean for God to build his church and what does it mean for God to bring his kingdom. But actually what happens in Jesus' life at that point is uh, he actually, we see him as we hear where he goes, he starts at that very moment, he starts walking towards Jerusalem. He starts making his way, from that moment on, he's starting to make his way to Jerusalem for what will ultimately become the, the, the event that changes human history as he hangs on a cross. And we're going to be talking more about that. But to understand that journey and to understand the moment he says, now is the Son of Man glorified, we want to trace a little bit of that journey to see if we can glimpse what Jesus meant when he talked about glory. As Jesus prepares to move towards Jerusalem, he comes to the Jordan River. There are a few ways he could have gone, but Jesus chooses to cross the Jordan River at Jericho. Just in the chat now, in Zoom, I want you to think about and see if anyone can remember in the Old Testament whether another Bible story where somebody crosses the Jordan River at Jericho. Can anyone remember that? Just, if you can, write it in the, in the chat. Now, I don't know if anybody was able to get the answer, but it is an interesting moment that Jesus chooses to cross the Jordan River at Jericho because the other person that crossed the Jordan River at Jericho was a man by the name of Joshua. Do you know what Joshua was doing when he crossed the Jordan River at Jericho? He was entering the promised land. How many tribes did Joshua cross the Jordan River at Jericho with? That's right, 12. 
how many disciples did Jesus cross the Jordan River at Jericho with? That's right, 12. And did you know what the Hebrew form of the name Jesus is? It's Yeshua. It is the same name as Joshua. Really, in choosing to cross the Jordan River at Jericho, Jesus is kind of saying, we are entering the new promised land. One of the challenges for those of us who don't grow up in Jewish households and, and don't read the Bible in its original languages, sometimes we can miss the deep significance of some of the, the stories of the Bible. Jesus crosses the Jordan River at Jericho and he meets a blind man, Bartimaeus. And we see this recorded in Mark, Matthew and Luke. And Bartimaeus says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What he's actually saying is Messiah, Messiah. Because everybody knew the son of David was that the Messiah was to be in David's line, a son of David. He's saying, Messiah, Messiah, have mercy on me. And this man who's crossed the Jordan River at Jericho with 12 disciples, now publicly, as a whole crowd of people are moving up towards Jerusalem for the Passover, now publicly responds to this man calling him the Messiah, not by telling him to shut up, but by healing his blindness. And we start to see why the crowds might be starting to talk. Because the man who called Jesus Messiah is now cured of his blindness. Very soon after, we get word that uh, Jesus' very good friend, Lazarus, is gravely ill. And this is one of the first times Jesus refers to glory in the book of John, in this second half of the, the book of John. Uh, and he says, this has happened so God could be glorified. And we get this picture as Jesus actually stays where he is for a day and a half, then makes the trip up to meet Mary and Martha. And we, and we see Jesus, see his two dear friends who are so upset because his friend had passed away and I, I love that one of the shortest verses in the Bible happens in this context we see Jesus who knows the answer he's going to give to their problems say not to Mary and Martha don't worry I've got it sorted out don't worry I'm going to fix it Jesus, the, the, we, we get this picture as he sees how heartbroken Mary and Martha are. We get this beautiful verse, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. I think too often we want to jump in with the answers rather than identifying with the pain of the people we are trying to respond to. And then what happens? Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. So this man who crossed the Jordan River at Jericho with his 12 disciples responded to a man who said he was the Messiah by healing his blindness, now raises someone from the dead. This was not normal. And this helps us start to understand why as Jesus makes his way up to Jerusalem, there were all these crowds on Palm Sunday saying, save now, save now, save now. And you would think, wouldn't you, given the definition of glory or the picture of glory that most of us have, that this would be when the Bible would say or when Jesus would say, now is the Son of Man glorified. But Palm Sunday was not the time. In fact, it was one of the saddest moments of Jesus' life before the cross. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 13. And we have this beautiful picture. 
uh, Jesus gets down and he washes the disciples' feet and he says, I have given you an example. He's already given them an example by crying when he sees someone grieving and now he gives them an example by serving. As their master, he serves. Then he sits down and has a meal with them and says, one of you is going to betray me. And they're all shocked. And they ask What's, who, who it is, how's it work? And Jesus looks up at Judas and says, what you're about to do, do quickly. I don't know if you can imagine what that would be like for Jesus. He has spent the last three years with Judas. He is invested in Judas and Judas is going to betray him. And the first thing that happens as the door closes and Judas goes out into the night to betray his master is Jesus says, John 13, 31, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. What's he talking about? How is that possibly glory? His best friend is selling him out. And Jesus is saying, now is the Son of Man glorified. To understand what the Bible means by glory, we need to understand a very important part of the book of Exodus that is the part of the Bible most quoted by the Bible. But it's also a part of the Bible that many of us will skip over because it's very complicated language. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus uh, chapter 34. But to set the scene, uh, Moses has had an incredible time up the mountain with God and he's received the Ten Commandments and he comes down the mountain and uh, his friend, Aaron, who he thought he needed to help him, he has discovered, uh, has led all the people astray and built a golden calf. And Moses is so angry that he throws his tablets down and breaks them and has to go back to spend time with God and says, look, I need help. I need help. I can't do this by myself. You must go with me. And we see that beautiful conversation uh, in Exodus 33. And, and God says to Moses, I've got you, mate. I know you by name. I, I am with you. Uh, and then, then Moses says something to God that becomes one of the, the, the framework for, for us understanding what God's glory is. Because Moses says, Look, I know you'll go with me, but I need more than that. Show me your glory. And then in chapter 34, we see it happening. We see God showing Moses his glory. Let's read this together. Verse, chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. He passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now remember, for many of us, when we think of glory, we think of praise or shining lights or honour. That's very different to this, isn't it? What is it, do you think, that God is saying His glory is? What is this? When God shows Moses His glory, He reveals this. Can you see that the glory of God is God's character? It's his moral nature. It's what is important to God. 
The glory of God is his character. And what is God's character? Well, as I said, this has been uh, one, this, this part of the Bible is the part of the Bible that other parts of the Bible most often refer to. You'll see this quoted again and again in places like the Psalms and Isaiah and, and right the way through. And, and it's clear that for the Jewish people of the New Testament, when they thought about the glory of God, they, they thought about this. And even today, Jewish people refer to this as a, a central framework for understanding. It is, they, they call it the 13 attributes. So what are, what, are, what are they? Well, can you see here that there are, in, for, for the sake of us who don't naturally speak Hebrew and don't naturally memorize scripture, we've grouped these attributes into three headings. Can you see the attributes of compassion. We see God describing himself as compassionate, abounding in love, faithfulness, and maintaining love to thousands. Compassion, it's all about love, and no matter what you do, there is this, this sense that God is loving. In addition to compassion, we see an another heading, mercy. And mercy uh, is what you receive even when you haven't done necessarily the right thing. The gracious God, slow to anger, forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. But it's interesting, God doesn't stop there, does he? We see that the attributes of compassion, the attributes of mercy, but we also see, don't we, the attributes of justice. He doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. We need to understand what these words mean. God's glory is his moral nature, it's his character. And his character is his justice, his mercy and his compassion. Let's start with justice. God's justice we see here it portrayed as uh, boundaries that there are consequences for if you cross over them. The movie uh, director Cecil B. DeMille uh, produced many, many years ago a movie called The Ten Commandments. And he said something interesting about the Ten Commandments. He said this, No one has ever broken the Ten Commandments. They've only ever broken themselves against the Ten Commandments. That is, when we choose to step outside of God's boundaries, we do damage to ourselves and damage to the people around us. That is the result of God's justice. We also see though, God loves us and loves the world. He is a loving God. The beautiful picture we have of, of God's compassion is uh, somebody who is, it's, the word comp for compassion means a deep commitment to. God is deeply committed to his people. And this beautiful picture of a merciful God, even though we make mistakes, God brings forgiveness. Just want to take a moment now and start to understand that this is the God we serve, a God of justice, a God of mercy and a God of compassion. These are the things that matter to God. And Isaiah tells us the whole earth is filled with God's glory. That it's almost like the glory of God, his justice, his mercy and his compassion are the foundations on which the earth is built. So we see that God's glory isn't necessarily about his honor. It's not about a shining light. It's about his character. It's who he is. And 
One of the things we need to understand is that Jesus was the reflection of the God who is just and merciful and compassionate. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. It made the, the, Literally, the word there for dwelling is the word tabernacle. We have seen His glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace, full of mercy and compassion, and full of truth full of justice. The Bible scholar Richard Borkham says this, John presents the incarnation of the word Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the Sinai covenant between Moses and God. A revelation of glory that fulfills the Sinai covenant by qualitatively surpassing it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. The glory is the only one from the Father, full of grace and truth. That God comes and dwells among us as Jesus Christ, the embodiment of justice and mercy and compassion, the embodiment of God's character. And what does that mean for us? Well, our call, as we've already said, that the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism says we are called to glorify God. Zechariah says this, Zechariah 9, this is what the Lord Almighty says, administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Don't oppress the widow or the fatherless or the foreigner or the poor. Don't plot against each other. It's interesting that he Zechariah picks on these groups of people, the widow, the fatherless, the foreigner, or the poor. In your family, in your society, in your church, the truest measure of how the glory of God is being manifest is how the weakest people are going. In a society, the weakest people are the homeless kids, the single mothers, the refugees, and the poor. They are the measure. They are the people that Jesus would always hang out with. And they are the measure at how we're going at caring for and exhibiting God's character in the light of his glory. In your family, there will be somebody who is the quietest somebody who gets the least attention how they are doing is the measure of God's glory in your family in your church there'll be somebody who is the most difficult to relate to somebody who has the least influence how they are doing is the measure of God's glory in your church this is what Zechariah is saying to us John says this, this is to my Father's glory, this is Jesus speaking in the book of John, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus is saying, show the world who I am by living my character. There's a, a, a beautiful quote by another Bible scholar, Richard Mellick, who says, Those who understand Jesus' glory by faith are called to act according to what they've seen. They represent God's glory on earth by the values they hold as well as by their actions. This is our call. This is why God's glory is so important as we understand God's glory is his justice, his mercy and his compassion. We are called to live these things. The glory of God is the path to whole life whole families, whole communities. The historian Anthony Froud said this, he said, one lesson 
and only one, history may be said to repeat with distinctness, that the world is built somehow on moral foundations. That in the long run, it is well with the good. In the long run, it is ill with the wicked. But this is no science. It's no more than the old doctrine taught long ago by the Hebrew prophets. We can trust that God has built the world on moral foundations, on the foundations of his glory, and ultimately justice and mercy and compassion are the best way to live. They produce the freedom of whole life. And wherever there is injustice, wherever people are not merciful and thinking of others, wherever people are not compassionate and not committed to other people, there is brokenness and hurt. But wherever we can be just and merciful and compassionate, it produces a healthy society. This quote by James Froud is handwritten by somebody who lived this. Here is the handwritten note of the quote by James Froud. Do you know whose handwriting that is? That's the handwriting of Martin Luther King Jr who ultimately would give up his life for the dream of a different kind of society. And he promised his people that ultimately God's justice, mercy and compassion will win. And today we see right across the world, his legacy lives on and continues to raise people to think in different ways about race. And we see even this year with the whole Black Lives Matter, the number of people who are referring back to Martin Luther King Jr., who was in turn inspired by Jesus and would carry this quote around. And he would often say that the arc of history bends towards justice, bends towards what is right. We need to understand, though, that none of us have what it takes to glorify God in our own strength. Glorifying God is only possible if you're open to Jesus. Jesus himself uh, is the, our model, but he is also the, the power in us that enables us to glorify God. This beautiful verse in Colossians 1.27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is, listen to this, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory isn't you working hard. It is you loving Jesus and letting Jesus work through you to care about the world in the way he cares about the world, to let your heart break in the same way his heart breaks. And we know that ultimately God's glory is going to cover the whole world. We know the end of the story. Habakkuk 2.14, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And we see right at the end of the Bible, Revelation 21, I didn't see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city doesn't need a sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of the Lord will give it light. God's character will be all we need to see what reality is. We will again, just as in the garden, be able to trust God's way of seeing and God's glory as our guiding light. This is the future we can look forward to. But for now, we need to be ready to open ourselves to the full weight of God's glory. Why did Jesus 
in the upper room say that now is the Son of Man glorified? Well, we see that on the cross, the full weight of God's justice meant the beautiful truth of his mercy and compassion. And it was only on the cross that those two things could come together. And freedom would be the result. And this is why Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. Because on God's, through God's action, through Jesus, on the cross, we see God's glory, his justice, mercy and compassion. And what does this mean for us? Well, Jesus says, you need to be ready to take up your cross. We live in a broken world. This is my city here in Hobart. There are many people in Hobart who are suffering. There are homeless people. There are single mothers. There are refugees here in Hobart that need to be loved, who need to experience God's justice, mercy and compassion. For you to be an agent of God's glory means you need to be ready to die to yourself. You need to be ready to open yourself to God's work in and through you, which will take the shape of a cross. But as you open yourself to Jesus' heart and his work, you will find that the glory of God becomes more and more normal part of your life and that the justice and mercy and compassion that you live will bring healing and hope to the people you live with every day. So finally, we're going to break you into your small groups. And I have some questions for you. You'll find the questions there in your notes as you look at, you, as you look at uh, what you need to be doing in your small groups. First, the first question is, what are the implications of what you have heard for you? How is the glory of God revealed in your life? Second one, if you're brave enough to say, where, where in your life do you most often fail to reflect God's justice, his mercy and his compassion? What steps with Jesus' help could you take to remedy that? And at the bottom of the page, you'll see these questions. What, is it, what does God's justice, mercy and compassion mean for your family? What does it mean for your neighbourhood, the people you live near? What does it mean for your workplace, where you work or where you go to school? What does it mean for your church? What would it mean for God's justice and mercy and compassion to be the, the framework that helps you understand what God cares about in those places? And I wonder what it might be that God is calling you to do about his glory, to glorify him in those places. I hope now you can see how important God's glory is. And many, many verses in the Bible will make more sense, like all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isn't that beautiful, though, that it is Christ in you that is the hope of glory? Can I just pray for us now as we get ready to go into our small groups? Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Help us glimpse your glory, your character, and help us, Jesus, to see the world the way you see it. And let our heart break for what breaks your heart. And call us. Jesus, to be agents of your justice and your mercy and your compassion. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now you can head off to your small groups.